Welcome to Find the Way. I'm Mike Sherbinal, and your and name is? I'm Laurel Lynn Tyler Thompson. Great really to be glad with you're you, with Mike. us back again. I'm, I'm so honored. We're talking about the book of Colossians in the New Testament. We're looking at the subject of what are the distinguishing markers of people who claim to be Christians. And as we begin the show today, Laurel Lynn, that becomes a very challenging subject in light of the political landscape that's going on right now. It really does, because uh, what happens is that one group uh, thinks that, that th their way is right, and another group thinks their way is right. We have religious groups, we have non-religious, you know, religious, more secular groups, and so we have clashes in our culture. And the freedom of religious expression is being challenged in so many places. Uh, recently, the province of Alberta was dealing with something in Calgary. I want to read it to you. Laura Lynn, you're going to comment, okay? But Curtis Clark, Alberta's Deputy Minister of Education, uh, was threatening Christian charter schools with defunding if they didn't remove the following content. Here it is in brief. We believe men and women were created in the image of God. Delete that from the Christian uh, schools uh, charter. To develop godly attitudes toward marriage and the family along with the understanding and skills needed to establish a God-honoring home. They want that deleted. They also want deleted the unchangeable and infallible truth of the Word of God. Those are foundations for us. Uh, God's institution of marriage, a covenant relationship between one man and one woman, is the sole environment within which sexual activity is permitted and is the context in which children are to be raised. They want that deleted and more. Mm -hmm. And that's happening here in BC as it's being challenged. Other provinces are grappling with it. How do we deal with this as Christians mm -hmm. w about our convictions? Well, what do we do? obviously, you know, uh, David Egan in uh, the Alberta area has decided that he would uh, like to really come against the Christian faith. And we have these different factions, so we have different belief systems that are now clashing. But in Canada, we have freedom of religion. We have freedom of conscience and uh, freedom of thought even, and freedom of speech, although it's actually not uh, you know, uh, as clear as in the United States. And so there is a huge backlash, and I think that we are seeing our faith under attack like we have never seen in our nation's history. I think what is really important in our spiritual journey is understanding some of the factors that shape us. And so as we begin to unpack this today, we have a special guest to help us. We really do. Uh, Dr. Daryl Ferguson, he's an incredible man. Uh, he's with the World View Study Center in Chilliwack, and uh, he has been studying worldviews our whole life. This is what leads to the problem you just mentioned. And how it shapes our thinking. Absolutely. And how people get so polarized. And our and nation fight. and our globe. So it's going to be a great discussion. We're going to be right back in a few moments. We're glad you're watching us at Find the Way. You can check us out at findtheway.tv. years ago my wife who loves to read various magazines decided that she would uh, buy the publisher sweepstake uh, deal and what that means is that as you purchase into it you get Reader's Digest you get uh, the home magazines you know Laurel and you know all the lists all I the girl do. magazines you know in yeah. fashion so exciting for me <laughs> but at least for me she ordered Sports Illustrated and I remember getting Sports Illustrated for a period of maybe uh, eight or ten months and as I would watch it every week it would describe some hero and a hero was basically who could put a basketball uh, through the hoop uh, sometimes the hero was who could put the puck in the net or who could hit the, uh, the ball the farthest. And I wondered, is that really a hero? We come today to the book of Colossians and we begin to understand what are the heroes in God's eyes? What makes up a hero? What are the markers for his children? Last week we talked about there was faith and there was love which was sacrificial and there was also hope that gave us incredible strength. Remember we were talking with Smita Singh who talked about the ministry she has in Calcutta, India, rescuing children out of sex slavery. When I think of that, that constitutes in my mind a real hero. We come now to God's Word and we begin to think about, especially in light of our opening commentary on the political scene that's all around us, how we're to walk as God's people in a way that brings honor to Him, in a way that we speak truth to those who might be in disagreement to us, but also to express His love in a deep and a profound way. 
And maybe what we need to think about is rather than just looking at Sports Illustrated, and that can be fun, and don't get me wrong, I love sports, and you know, I, I love the, uh, the giftings that some of these athletes have, but that's not in my mind what is a real hero. What it is is that I, we have to realize is that the people that we model and the people that we look to become our markers. And so if we're always looking at a certain kind of person because of their natural ability, I think that's gonna take us down a dangerous road, like come on people, let, let, let's have a life. Let's think about who it is that we're looking to who will really influence us, who will make a difference. I remember one day that Mother Teresa was being interviewed uh, on the ministry that she was doing and the reporter who shoved the microphone in her mouth said, Mother Teresa, I wouldn't do what you do for a million bucks. And she looked at him and said, neither would I. There was something deeper, there was a higher calling. In the book of Colossians, Paul writes to the church and he had some things to say. He says in verse three of chapter one, we always thank God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ when we pray for you. And he mentions why, he says your faith and your love and your hope. But then if we jump down, he talks about in verses six to eight, about what were the models that he was following and that the people should be following. And he said, as I'm talking about the word of truth which has come to you, as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and increasing, it is also doing this among you since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth. And then he says, just as you learned what God's grace was all about from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. I wouldn't recommend calling any of your kids Epaphras, but it was the name given to this guy, and he was a pillar in the church. And Paul said, look at him, he's a model. What made him stand out and be so significant? Well, he calls him, he says, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf. The word servant is powerful. It actually, while it sounds kind of nice and endearing, it's not what I want to be. Matter of fact, my body just rebels against serving. It is very unnatural. I'd prefer if people would serve me. Many times when I'm in a restaurant, I watch how the waiter or the waitress, you know, takes care of the people. And I try to be very attentive to them and appreciative, even though I know it's their job. But many people just fluff them off. You know, they're there to wait on them. And it's almost like they, they ex get abused in a way, if I can use that word, uh, as they come and serve. They're almost like a non-entity. Paul wrote of Epaphras that he was a humble servant who cared for people. In other words, he put their interests ahead of himself, and not because he was being paid, but it was because he was radically uh, changed by the love of Jesus. And so he did what others didn't naturally do kind of what Smita Singh was doing last week and talking about her ministry in Calcutta. Um, it's what we're gonna hear about later on in the program, about many different people who are standing up and serving the body of Christ all across Canada. Now, how do we allow our values to be shaped by people? You know, Paul wrote about this guy again in another letter that he wrote in Philippians 2.29. He said, honor men like Epaphras, or honor women like him, uh, because he almost died for the work of Christ. He says, these are the people that are to be your role models. Well, as we begin to think about what distinguishes us as Christ followers, one of those things is the people that we model ourselves after. Who are you modeling yourself after? Maybe you need to think about that and think about how it has shaped your worldview and what you're currently doing with your life right now even what you're giving your energy to. This is part of what it means to be a follower of Jesus, to think differently, to go about life differently. But blended in with faith, hope, and love, and who our models are, Paul writes about something else. And he says this, Epaphras is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us, this is interesting, your love in the Spirit your love in the Spirit. What on earth is that all about? Because their love in the Spirit was one of the markers of this church is what set them apart. So as Laura Lynn talks a, a little bit later with our guest about how we respond politically to this charged environment that we're in, we're gonna see right now in the book of Colossians that our love in the Spirit is to be the way that we represent Jesus. He says that Epaphras told us of your love in the Spirit. You know, in the Bible, 
the Holy Spirit, which he's referring to, is described as a dove. In Luke 3, 21, we read, when all the people were baptized and when Jesus had also been baptized, the heavens were opened and the Holy Spirit, we read, descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice from heaven came saying, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. Our love in the Spirit, the Spirit that came upon Jesus Christ, the Spirit that fills you the moment you say, Lord, I want you to be my leader and Lord. His Spirit will come and dwell within you. But the deal is this. Many times the world looks at us and says, oh, Christians are hypocrites. And I believe it's because we have quenched the Spirit of God in our lives. Sometimes we don't respond in love. We respond in selfishness. We want to put my needs ahead of other needs. Sometimes in my marriage, you know what? I want to put my needs ahead of my wife's. When we were recording this show, we were bantering back and forth with Laura Lynn and her husband, Jim, who's here as well. And I was saying, you know, does, does Jim serve you, Laura Lynn, or, or vice versa? But listen to this story. The author, R.J. Keniston, wrote in his book called The Sensitive, Sensitivity of the Spirit, he tells about a couple. And the couple's name were Sandy and Bernice. They went as missionaries to Jerusalem. And when they arrived in Jerusalem, outside of the the balcony of their apartment, there was a dove that seemed to just take up residence and they were quite intrigued. But they noticed that whenever they got angry with each other or shouted, the dove went away. And they pondered and thought about that. And they said, either we can give in to our human nature or we can represent the Spirit, we can let the Spirit of Christ live through us even as we talk in private as husband and wife. And you know, when they talk kindly and gently to each other, the dove stayed, almost as if God was giving His sign, His blessing on that couple. Interesting story. But you know, if a dove would fly away at the sound of a harsh word, how much more will the Holy Spirit depart from us if we say, if we act in ways that are not honoring to Him? And Paul writes, he says, don't quench God's Spirit in your life because the spirit alive in us is the marker, one of the markers that we really are, the people of God. Let's just talk about that for a minute because mm. that was a whole lot of stuff. Lot what of jumped stuff. out to you? Well, it, it does remind me of how the Holy Spirit is, is gentle as a dove and He is the one teaching us constantly to have that love. And of course, as humans, we fail. We fail each other in our marriages. We fail each other uh, in our relationships and in society sometimes, right? But that Holy Spirit, He is the one who teaches us to be loving. I just thought that was an amazing teaching. You know, God wants you to know today by His Spirit that despite your past, today is a new beginning. And as we continue to teach, as we listen to uh, our special guest, he talks about what has shaped us. Let's let the Word of God, His Holy Spirit, shape us to be the men, the women that He's called us to be. We'll be right back. I'm here with Dr. Daryl Ferguson. He is a great friend. He's also the director of the Worldview Studies Center. And uh, Daryl, you deal with uh, Worldview, and we are dealing with some things. Of course, at the top of the show, uh, Mike was able to kind of share what's going on in Alberta. And actually, there is a real shift in what's going on across Canada. And maybe you can shed some light. What is happening? Well, you know, Christianity is a worldview. We're to love God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength. The Bible addresses every part of life. So a worldview is a picture of all of life. So all humans have a worldview, even atheists, just to mention that. So I don't use the word religion right. because atheists think they're non-religious, but they have a worldview. It's called secular humanism. So what we're seeing in Canada is, is the result of Christians having withdrawn from the civic sphere over the, in the 80s and 90s when I was a Christian. Right. And the atheists, the secular humanists, have taken over and are simply legislating their morals, which is part of their worldview. So is that got, really what's happened? Yeah, yeah. Like they have gone into politics while we just thought, no, no, we're just going to do yeah. church really well. Yeah, we're just going to have a personal relationship with God, but no public expression. And Christians in my era, I became a Christian in 1975, 
they were talking about the rapture, so they were pulling out. You don't worry about the world, it's going right. to end soon, right? So right. the Christian, Jesus is coming any yeah, day. So what happened is they, they abandoned yeah. uh, nation building. Uh, what Matthew 28, 18 says, make disciples of all the nations, mm. teaching them all. So the church started teaching itself to love Jesus. We had wonderful conferences and prayer times and charismatic things. But what about the society? We let it right. rot. And the Bible says, you are the salt of the world in Matthew 5:13. But if you lose your salt, mm. you'll, you're useless and you'll be trampled underfoot by men. So what we're experiencing now is the trampling underfoot mm. by men, by the secular humanists who've taken the courts. They simply legislate euthanasia, abortion, same-sex marriage, marijuana, mm -hmm. and now transgenderism. Yes. And this will continue because atheists have a worldview and their worldview is anti-God. Mm -hmm. And the Bible is very clear that we should bring every thought captive, Colossians 2.8. We're yes. at war with this philosophy. Now we love humanists, we love people, but we don't love their gods. We don't love their false philosophies. Mm. In fact, we're at war with it. Right. Second Corinthians 10.4 says we're at war with every idea raised up against God. Right. So that's what we're dealing with. I think that Christians struggle with this, Daryl. They're like, well, am I supposed to lo be all loving and just keep, you know, preaching the gospel and, you know, not being uh, contrary? Or when you say this, this is, this is like we are at war. So how do we be at war in our culture and yet still loving those that are caught up in a different worldview? Well, there's two. One of the things you said is we should just be preaching the gospel. Mm -hmm. Well, this is the gospel. So right. the gospel of salvation is one part, but the Bible also refers to the gospel of the kingdom. Mm -hmm. So when you say, well, we should just preach the gospel. Yes, we should. The whole Bible. There's, the book of Kings is a book of politics. So I, I haven't heard many pastors read from the book of Kings. Why not? Uh, it's about leadership. In fact, I want to read. May I just take this yes, verse absolutely. right now? This gives us a clue. As, as to what the church's relationship is meant to be. In, the, in uh, 2 Kings 12, <clears throat> verse 1 to 3, it says, In the seventh year of Jehu, Joash became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 40 years. So we read about a king. He's a political leader. The Bible's not saying that's evil. <laughs> so why aren't we aspiring to be leaders? Right. Um, his mother's name was Zibia. She was from Beersheba. Jo Joash did what was right in the eyes of the Lord all the years that Jehoiada the priest instructed him. Mm. This is an unbelievable verse. Right. Do, do you see whose job it is, is to train the leaders? Mm. What does it say there? He was a good political leader as long as the priest, the church, trained him. Instructed him in what? Wow. The ways of God. So here we see the separation of the church and state, okay? There are those called to be pastors. They are the priesthood. They are the Levites. I'm not a Levite. I'm not called to be a pastor. But the Levite's job in a church is to train people to be police officers, presidents, politicians, uh, prime ministers, lawyers, doctors. So that's the job of the church. Now the church was training people to be missionaries and pastors, but not politicians, right. not lawyers. So we lost the court. We've lost the government and the secular humanists have taken over and we wonder, hey, how come we're losing this battle? Right, how come all of these uh, things are coming against us? So our rights are being really infringed on. We've had the Trinity Western thing happen right here in our own neighborhood. We have, you know, uh, Alberta all up in arms with, you know, freedom of religion being taken away. Well, this is what secular humanism does. Mm. And so, so if you look at Marxism, which is a variety of secular, it's a variety of atheism, Right? It's operating in North Korea and, and formerly in the Soviet Union and China. Well, what do they do with Christians? Do they celebrate that there? China is knocking down churches. Mm. And people are going, well, how is this happening? Well, you're dealing with atheists. You're dealing with the atheist worldview. Welcome to earth. It's not like these people suddenly emerged. Right? This has been going on for centuries. We right. just have let them win. It's like the Canucks wow. go on the ice and decide we're not going to take our hockey sticks with us. Right. We're going to kick the puck. I guarantee you're going to lose because you're not using the tools. God so to everybody that's listening right now, we understand. I mean, we've got all of these different worldviews. Uh, what do you say to Christian parents right now? What do you say to those out there? Uh, I know recently here in our own city, a whole bunch of us have put our name forward to become school trustees, something we never thought we'd do. Right. But because we see the, uh, the sex activist curriculum that's in our schools, we've all said, hey, we're going to be a part of the, you know, making a difference here. Is that beginning to happen? Yes, I think Christians are coming alive to the idea that they need to be active and demonstrate the ways of God. You know, Psalm 68 says, let God arise and his enemies will be scattered. 
Well, Dr. Ferguson, I appreciate your time and I also appreciate your courage. You are a strong voice in this nation and you give us all information, knowledge uh, and strength to be able to stand up in a world where we sometimes wonder what is going on and it is time to stand. Thank you for your words. We'll You're be welcome. right back. Thank you. Today we want to talk to you about an opportunity to build a house of hope in Calcutta, India. It's for children who have been caught in the sex trade. And not only for them, but especially for their children so that they don't have to repeat the horrific experiences that their mothers have gone through. And with me is Smita, who's a very big part of this. It's your dream, tell us about it. So we would like to have this house right in the middle of the largest red light district in Calcutta called Sonagachi, so we can prevent hundreds of children from being exploited. And Chan, you're with Partners International, you're across Canada. How can Canadians help today? Two ways, praying and supporting. And if a thousand Canadians give $40, we can actually purchase the house. That is amazing. Purchase a house for 40,000, another 60,000 will renovate it. We're asking Canada to give $100,000. Go to our website, maybe you can give 20 or 40. Maybe you can write even a greater check. Go to our website. We'll direct you to Partners International and you can change the destiny of a little girl or a little boy. You know, as we listen to that interview between uh, Laura Lynn and Daryl, uh, how powerful that was is we heard about the various things that shape us, that influence us, uh, oftentimes in a very negative way. In the midst of all the things that are shaping us and influencing us, Jesus calls for his church to be salt. Uh, salt that flavors, salt that makes a difference. We're also called to be lights, lights in the midst of darkness. The last two weeks, we've been talking about markers in the Christian life. And if you remember from last week, I talked about my GPS story. That GPS is the one that guides me from marker to marker uh, so that I can find my way home. And part of our program is uh, called Find the Way. And we wanna help people find their spiritual home to find what it means to walk in the security, to walk in the strength that God gives us. And part of that is being His presence in the midst of the world. Uh, of being his hands, his feet, to extend life, to extend love, and to extend hope to people. We were teaching through the book of Colossians that, that faith and hope and love are the markers of God's people. But also one of the markers of God's people, as I said earlier in the program, are the models that we follow. We also said that it's our love in the Spirit, the Spirit of Christ living through us and loving through us that becomes another marker. But what we find here in the final part is that what is to be a distinguishing feature in the Christian is that we're to be filled with the knowledge of His will and that becomes a marker. God wants you to be filled with the knowledge of His will. God often will speak into your life, He'll encourage you, He'll call you to do things and, and you can either ignore that or you can respond to that. It's kind of like how this program started. One person who was not and is not yet a Christ follower said to me, Mike, you've got the answers that people are looking for. You should be sharing them. And as I listened to that, I realized that God was speaking to me. And as we share through Find the Way, we want you to know what it means to be filled with the knowledge of His will. Part of God's will for me is to speak His word, is to proclaim it all across our country. So what is it that we are influenced by? What is it? What are our motives? Because if my motives are selfishly driven, then I'm not going to be doing the things that Jesus wants me to do. And a life uh, void of purpose is empty and meaningless. If your life is all about yourself and you're a child of God, if all you're pursuing is uh, another 18 holes in the golf course or another hockey game or building a bigger and better house, there will be an emptiness and a dryness. So I want to speak to those of you who are Christ followers today and say, I want you to be filled with the knowledge of His will. If you have that beautiful home that you're building, I want to ask, who are you inviting in? What are the friends, the neighbors, the down and outs that you're bringing into your place? And when you go golf or when you go play pickup hockey or whatever, who are you hanging out with? Invite someone to go with you and speak into their lives. You see, to know God's will is to allow all these different markers to influence us. You know, in Romans chapter 14, it says, so then let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. 
And by the mutual upbuilding, what we find here is that that is part of God's will for us. We read in Colossians 1, verse 9 and 10, from the first day we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Many times people want to know, well, what's God's will for my life? I, I want to suggest that we need to ask a different question. Not what is your will for my life, but God, what is your will? Look around to see where God is at work and join Him in it. And I would suggest these five things that R.T. Kendall once said. He said, as you discern God's will for your life, ask, does the door open without you having to knock it down? See what doors God is opening. And then what do you suppose your enemy would want you to do? Satan, do the opposite is what he points out. And what's your authority? If it's in the Word of God, that will give you the strength to press on. And as you step out in the will of God, does your confidence increase or diminish? Because God who is with you will never fail you or forsake you. And then do you have an ease of heart in what you are doing? You see, the right markers are what will lead you in the right way. Study His Word. And I pray, my hope for you, is that you will discover the fullness to which God has called you to be and that you will live and you will walk in it. We're glad you've been watching today. This has been a very interesting program and next week I think is going to be similar as we talk about how we integrate our faith in life and how we represent Jesus well. Laura Lynn, what's your takeaway personally, like from today? You know, I was really uh, struck by how many people are now realizing that we have got to get into the political arena. We've got to encourage our children to do so. It's not that we're all called there, but certainly we have missed opportunities in the past to engage as salt and light in that sphere, in the political sphere. And uh, we've done church well, and uh, you know, and media certainly, you know, with great shows yeah. like Find the Way. Um, but let's let's all be more engaged in what's happening because there are people out there who are nonstop heading to Ottawa to try to influence policy so that their worldview is what we all have to live under. I think one of the interesting things, Laura Lynn, is what Paul writes in the New Testament. He said, "Always be prepared to give an answer for the hope." that is within you. Right. And so one of the things that we want to do here at Find The Way is that while you might not agree with us, I want to present the claims of Jesus in a winsome way. I believe you do as well. If you go to our website, there are all sorts of resources there that can help you in that journey. There are mentors that you can talk to where you can pound out those difficult questions, say, help me to understand why you think this or why you think that. We don't want you to check your mind at the door. We're glad you're watching us and don't be afraid to ask the questions, because we want and we believe that the Jesus that we talk about yes. really is the answer. He really is the answer, and uh, and we can trust him, and he loves us, and he made us, and he knows what we're good at, and he knows our destiny, and so he is our all in all. That's why we do this. Have a great day. <laughs>